uh, Dr. Abdullah Erglu was my uh, mentor for this project, uh, so he's here. Uh, so thank you. Um, introduction to computer programming and robotics. Uh, what the heck is that? Part of it's over here on this chair. Uh, I'll try and explain uh, the rest as we go along. Um, sort of in reference to what uh, Dr. Mann was saying before, both my parents are teachers, so even though teaching isn't something that I really want to do in the future, uh, I sort of didn't have a choice, you know, it's just instinct. Um, so that's what I ended up doing. So my project had two parts. Uh, the first part was a two-day workshop that I taught. It was for 8th uh, to 10th grade students. Um, and this was originally going to be in Fort Wayne. Uh, it didn't work out. Um, ended up being in Coldwater, Michigan, which is where I grew up. Uh, the second part was a website. had all the tutorial information, which I'll explain, from uh, the actual two-day workshop. Put it into the website so that anybody on the web at large could uh, learn the same things. I'll explain more about that as well. So um, this was a workshop that was designed to start from the ground up in terms of what computer programming is. None of these students had any previous experience with computer programming. Certainly they'd never done anything with robotics before. So to them, over these two days, I had to take them from knowing absolutely nothing about what computer programming or computer coding means, transform them into people who could uh, make this robot, uh, which you can see up here, and I'll show a picture of. Hopefully you can see this. I can move it if you can't. Um, but I had to get them to this end process in you know, two days of about five hours each. Um, so not a particularly easy to task uh, to do. And so like I said, by the end, uh, each of them got one of these robotic arms. They each got to take it home with them at the end of the course. Uh, so hopefully they'll, uh, they've learned something. They'll continue to continue uh, learning more about programming, robotics in the future. So why did I do this? Um, there are a lot of things out there already for this kind of thing. You know, you can, you can go on the internet and you can find, like I say, thousands of different tutorials on what it means to be a programmer, how do you learn programming, how do you start robotics. This kind of thing is out there. But if it's about robotics, it's expensive. And if it's not about robotics, it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit biased there. But uh, <laughs> what you should actually take away from this is that most of those tutorials on the internet, and I'll explain a little about this in a minute. They give you some really basic examples, and you go from these basic examples through even more boring examples. And then you get deeper and deeper into programming, but you don't learn to do anything interesting. Um, because these are all you know, online things. These aren't like classroom environments. They're not lab environments. So how can you give something to somebody online that they can actually engage with and want to learn from? Uh, so that was the goal of my project. Uh, that's what I really wanted to learn, uh, whether I could do this better than other people already had. So if they were going to have to build a robot, they're going to have to know some things first. Um, the first thing, you have to know a little bit about electricity, how it works, basically just how does a battery work and how does uh, electricity flow through a circuit. Very basic introduction for them to that. Um, then explained LED lights. They actually got some of these. They got to work with them. These are just sort of like LED light bulbs, except smaller and they just blink and flash um, and they learned how to control these themselves from a program. But the interesting thing about these is they're not just like a frivolous small tiny example that you put on a breadboard or, or um, in any circuit that you do. LEDs are used you know to show if your cell phone's charging, if your car is about to get out of gas and you should really get off the highway. Uh, it's something that the students can see right in front of them as they're learning uh, and they can uh, see like a visual example that they're actually achieving something. Raspberry Pi mini computer doesn't look like that. I'll show an actual picture of it in a minute. Uh, basically, just a really small computer that I'll explain. And they use the Python programming language, which <coughs> I will also explain in a minute. That's the actual Raspberry Pi. Um, it's just a small computer, like a really small computer. You guys probably can't see this one up here because it's got a cluster of wires all over it. But it's about the size of a credit card. Yeah, you can't see it. Sorry. <laughs> about the size of a credit card. And this one's even smaller. Uh, it's a different version than the one I have up there. Main takeaways here. That's the computer that you, know, you would have. It's called a CPU. Have that in every computer ever. It's got an HDMI port, so you can connect to a monitor. Uh, it's just got USB ports. Uh, the different thing about the Raspberry Pi, and the reason that we use this rather than any other normal computer, is over on the left side here, those pins let you directly interface your computer to an electrical circuit. 
This isn't something you can do with a normal computer at all. Uh, so this lets the students take a wire from any of those pins, connect it to the LEDs I was talking about, make the LED turn off and on, uh, which you can't do with a normal computer. Best part, $25 each. When you're talking about uh, 15 students, which is how many I had in this project, um, you're not going to buy on $200 computers for a two-day course. Uh, so $25 works out a little bit better. Uh, this is the programming language I used. I'm just going to briefly cover this because I think probably most of the people in here aren't interested about it. Um, but it's been around a long time, which means it has a big community. So anybody who's learning how to program, they're going to be able to look at this programming language, they're going to see the community, they're going to be able to find a lot of help online if they need it. Uh, it's also on like every computer system you've ever used. So you don't have to learn a new programming language if you switch from a Mac to Windows or something like that. And it's used by everybody. The people who just started, like I taught, uh, the people who have been doing it for 20, 30 years. They all use Python. It's got a uh, vast array of things you can do with it. And that's partly because it's got a low learning curve. OK. Sorry about this slide, but hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Um, the thing about Python is that it's really easy to translate a real life situation into programming code. So let's look at the left side first here. Just think about this. If something is true, you want to do another thing. If the temperature is below 65 degrees, you want to turn on the heat in your house. If it's over 80, OK, that's way too hot. We need to turn on the air. If it's not either of those, maybe we do nothing. So let's come up with a different situation. Let's say you're, um, say you're an email scammer. And you send a bunch of emails out. You're like, hey, I'm a Nigerian prince. And uh, I've got a million dollars. I'm just begging, begging to give away. Uh, so how do I do that? And so this is sort of a stupid example of that. So you send out this email to people. And you say, yeah, I've got all this money. All I need is your bank account, your social security number. Uh, and they say, oh, yeah, that sounds like a great deal. So boom, you transfer the money. If they say yes, you do something. If they say, wow, this is kind of a stupid thing. Why would anybody give you that? Um, I know where you are. I'm calling the police. They're coming to your house right now. OK, you want to get the heck out of there. <laughs> and if they don't say anything, maybe you just skip to the next one. Sort of a dumb little example of uh, how you can translate a real situation into programming code. So like I said, this was originally supposed to happen in Fort Wayne. Um, and when it was going to happen in Fort Wayne, Dr. Eric Liu, as well as, well as uh, Carol Dostal from the engineering department, um, helped a lot in trying to get it all organized. It just so happened that the engineering department, uh, engineering department was having renovations at the same time. Didn't work out. There's no space. Ended up doing it in Coldwater, Michigan, which meant I had to find other people who were willing to help me for free because I didn't have anything to pay them. <laughs> and they were going to have to put in a decent bit of work just to get it all organized. Um, somehow, I found a couple people, uh, Joe and Stuart Sebesky. Uh, Stuart is Joe's son. And the reason they were willing to do this is because they're willing to do just about anything. They're the most positive, uh, go get them kind of people that you'll ever meet. And they do a lot of stuff already. Stuart is actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for most uh, Rubik's Cubes solved while riding a unicycle. <laughs> if you want to know how many it is, it's 80. Why? Because he only had 80 Rubik's Cubes. Um, <laughs> so so uh, anyways, the class took place in Joe Spesky's room. Um, he works at the Career Center in Coldwater. And uh, so he already had all the monitors I was going to need, keyboards, mice, um, all of that stuff. So that made it really simple. It was just happenstance that the person who was willing to help me happened to have all this really cool stuff. Um, and since he worked at the nearby Career Center, that uh, is used by people from nearby counties. So I reached you know, maybe four different counties. Of course, I only had 15 students, but it was still a pretty large area that got people involved in. Um, as an example of how much Joe helped me, this is a really nice looking flyer here. Um, and just sort of take a look at it, because I'll show you why it matters. Uh, this is a nice look at, you know, it just get your signature down here. I give permission for photos. It looks cool. It looks engaging. Um, this is what I gave him to work with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I think I might have had a slightly lower participation rate if I had gone with this one instead. All right, so in case you can't see that arm up there, um, 
this is the robot arm that each of them got. So again, every single one of them got one of the computers. Every single one got one of these robotic arms to work with and to take home when they were done with the workshop. Um, you can't, if you can't see this, it's about this tall, not particularly large, uh, but it's small enough that I actually 3D printed this here on campus. Uh, so I 3D printed one of these for each student. Um, I put them together. Um, each of them has four motors, which means that it can turn on its base, go up and down, forward and backward. And it's got a couple of claws that pinch together. Help you visualize a little bit what kind of an environment they were working in. Um, that's me up there. There's 15 or 16 desks scattered around, uh, 15 students. Um, they each had their computer, like I mentioned, hooked up to one display. Then on the other display, that was actually hooked up to my laptop up there. So as they were working through things, I would give them an example of how a particular programming principle worked, and then I would give them like a little challenge. So they would take what I taught them, they would apply that to whatever challenge I gave them. They'd be able to see examples on the side. Uh, they could see you know, charts or diagrams. Um, I did a couple really bad drawings in Microsoft Paint to try and illustrate things. Uh, they could see all of that on the right monitor, look right back at the left monitor and keep going. Uh, that way they weren't just you know, working off a PowerPoint slide or something. Uh, I was doing things live in front of them, so it seemed applicable, like they were actually doing something that other people did and that mattered. Uh, so this is the schedule of the events, and I'll just sort of touch the high points here. When you first start learning how to program, the first thing pretty much anybody does is called the hello world example, which is just getting the computer to say hello to you. So that's the first time, honestly, maybe the first time in your life the computer did exactly what you told it to do and nothing else. So that's what they learned first. Where most other programming tutorials stop is, well not stop, but they do this and then they do something like, okay, if Susie got a 94 on her test, did she get an A, did she get a B? Uh, they do the, uh, uh, the temperature example that I gave you earlier, except you can't actually change any temperatures. They just print more stuff out on the screen. You don't actually do anything. You don't see anything in front of you to visualize what you're learning. So that's what I do. The next step, right after Hello World, is using those input-output pins I told you about that let you uh, uh, connect to electrical circuits. So right after they do this Hello World, they move into controlling these LEDs to turn them on and off. First it's just blinking, then it's pulsing, and you're getting brighter and then uh, down to uh, off again. Um, and finally, I'm standing in the way of this, uh, finally, on the end of the first day, they moved into uh, controlling servo motors. Uh, servo motors are motors, and the cool thing about them is that it's really easy to change the position of the motor very precisely. So for robotics, this is incredibly important because you want to tell it exactly where to go. So the students learned how to use these uh, as well by the end of the first day. Starting the second day, um, I had to sort of drag them back down a little bit. All right, you did all the fun stuff. Now we actually have to learn a little bit more about programming and how it works. Uh, so they still had all the fun, cool toys to play with in the first day. We just applied those in a few new ways. And I won't explain in detail these programming principles, uh, but basically what these things called classes and objects allow programmers to do is to take some code that they already wrote, for example, if they wrote some code for the servo here, and the computer will copy and paste that for them. So instead of writing more programs and more programs for every single servo they want to control, they can use the same thing they already wrote for all four motors in the robot. This just made it really simple for them to expand from the one servo that we had on the first day to four servos and moving an entire robot by the end of the second day. Uh, without uh, these principles, it wouldn't have been nearly as fast. So students get bored. I don't know if you know that. Um, but occasionally they lose interest in the things you're trying to tell them. And that could be for a variety of reasons. That can be because you're going too fast for them, you don't teach them, uh, you don't teach them at the right speed. They might be way too fast. Um, again, it just might not be engaging. So these are the problems that I needed to fix if I was going to do uh, a live workshop like I did. So uh, first of all, I sort of said before, I had the monitor on the side here. So I could teach them a programming principle. And then I would give them a challenge, and they would have to figure out how to apply that principle themselves. So it was more of an active learning process. And this tied in perfectly with being able to see the lights turn on and off in front of them. They're actively seeing uh, what they're learning. Um, I had to keep the fast guys busy. I mean, most of my time, of course, 
I'm one person, 15 students. Uh, there were two other helpers there, but I was the one with the most experience, of course, in uh, what I was doing. So really, I was running around the room helping 15 students. Uh, it meant that I didn't really have time uh, to go over to the fast ones and say, oh, yeah, you did a great job. Now just sit there for, you know, five or ten minutes while the rest of them finish whatever they're doing. So I gave them more challenges on top of, you know, the other things I already had. Uh, these weren't just, like, frivolous. They were uh, real examples that would help expand their knowledge of whatever programming principles uh, they were learning about at the time. And so, yeah, I had to be that person. A couple pictures from the workshop. Um, you can see, you can probably not see, but a little servo here. This is the second day. Uh, you can see someone here working, and he was uh, working off some examples that I had there before. That guy in the far right is working with some of the LEDs uh, the first day. So a little more of a visualization of uh, what I was doing. Oh, yeah. So I've got a little demo here. I don't know how many people can see this, so I'm going to try and move it over. Um, all right. So uh, basically what they were going to have to do, again, there's four motors. They're going to have to learn how to control the base. They're going to have to make it go up and down and uh, extend and come back and then move the pincers too. So they have to know how to do all this. So what at the end, the students were supposed to be able to do is be able to uh, program this robot entirely by themselves uh, so that, you know, hopefully they understand all of the code they wrote. Uh, they understood the examples that I gave them and know how to apply that to a real life situation. It kind of freaks out a little bit. All right, so you can see it moves <laughs> left and right. And um, even though I was maybe more experienced than those students, theirs actually worked better than this, again, for the same reason I explained before. Um, theirs worked super smooth. So at the end of the second day, they all had these robots moving. Each of them got to see this doing exactly what they told to in front of them. And that was easily the best moment of the workshop because they all had giant smiles on their faces uh, when they got these working. Um, so it goes back. And it can extend forward. And come on, Claw. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> a little jumpy. And of course, it can go forward and backward as well. Um, yeah. All right. Enough fun for now. A little idea of what the students ended up with at the end of the second day. So I did get some thoughts from them. Um, again, originally I was planning on doing this in a different place. Uh, I was originally planning on doing more of them uh, than ended up working out um, for various reasons. But I did get some informal thoughts um, that they wrote down on pieces of paper and I later just sort of concatenated. So main takeaway, they all wanted it to be more than two days, which in my opinion is the biggest success. Um, of course, the, ro the robot is super cool. So um, if any of you don't agree, doors that way. <laughs> And uh, where could they learn more? Um, which, again, I had the, I sort of hate to say this, but it's not because they were dumb. It's just because they'd never used computers, like in general, before. The slowest person in the class, again, they came from someplace in rural Kentucky. I'm not just saying that because I don't like Kentucky people. They were literally from rural Kentucky. <laughs> they, had no, they had never used, um, at least not to a major extent, computers before, besides you know, maybe a little bit of Microsoft Word. Um, so that person in my class came up to me at the end and wanted to know more <coughs> about where they could learn more, where they could do more. Uh, and they were one of the most excited people um, for this whole project at the end. So to me, that was a really cool moment. A um, couple other people wanted to know how they could turn the robot into a big metal robot. I don't know. <laughs> so, and um, I did have some correspondence with a couple of the students uh, afterwards via uh, email. Um, and I don't know, just to sort of emphasize, they really liked it. And in terms of that, I think that the workshop was a pretty big success. So the other part of this uh, was a website that I made. Um, originally, this was just supposed to be a communication tool for the students. Um, so uh, before, before the workshop, they could go here. They could see what they were going to learn. Uh, ended up being a full tutorial. So everything from the workshop put into the website as well as how and where they could print this 3D arm um, so that they can actually, anybody on the internet can do this themselves if they're so inclined. Um, 
So it's, uh, it's a website, it's a tutorial. I'd say it's always in a development stage. Maybe this one's particularly in the development stage, but I've got the full tutorial up there now, and it does generate somewhere between 10 to 50 hits a day, which I think is pretty decent in terms of, I, I don't know, I've done like no advertising for this. So uh, I think that's pretty good, and in the future, I can always do more with it. So um, I'm going to bring up, this is a little slow to load, so bear with me here. Um, I've got a copy of the site on this thumb drive that I'll bring up. I'll just show you what I'm trying to accomplish uh, with the website and sort of what's available to students through it. So like I said, it's a full tutorial. Uh, so the general idea is that you can go all the way from not knowing anything about programming to building and programming this robot uh, all by yourself. And so uh, this includes the 3D printed ARM files, um, which I had to design myself. They were based off some earlier examples, and then I had to expand those to actually be usable in this circumstance. There you go. So it's got some information here about Summer Workshop, of course. And anyone who visits this site is greeted with the Raspberry Pi, with a big smiling face on it, and um, what they can do to get started and actually start learning about this project, just what they'll need. And I'll just show you one of the tutorial pages. This is the one uh, about those LEDs I was talking about, how they can turn them on and off, how they can make them blink, change brightness. Uh, so what I want to do is make the website, even though the interactive part is supposed to be actually doing it yourself, I also wanted to make the website as interactive and useful as possible. Um, so for example, I show them how they can hook up their circuits. Um, I give them a ton of like little links that they can follow that lead them to more information. I've got some uh, cool little pop-ups somewhere that I don't know, that show more information. Of course, more information everywhere. I try and make it really easy for these people to expand their knowledge about programming, uh, about the broader concepts of computing, and how they can uh, integrate these into their lives or into their careers if they want to. So coming back to the goals of this, um, I really, I, first I had to teach these students and they had no prior experience and I had to get them to this endpoint where they actually had a moving robot. That part, at least, I know I accomplished. I also wanted to do so in a way that was inspiring, that led them to continue doing this. And for a couple of students, at least, I know I did this. Uh, but there was enough engagement along the way, enough smiles along the way in the workshop, uh, that I think this was successful, too. And through the website, as well as just talking to students afterwards, I'm trying to give everyone who does this tutorial access. You know, this is sort of like college. You, know, you don't learn everything in college. In fact, you forget a lot of the stuff you do learn in college, but you learn how to find stuff. You learn where to find stuff and what you need to do and how you can utilize the information that you have. So that's what I really want to do, especially with the website, is give them access to more. So even if they forget the basic concepts of programming, they can come back to this later and they know where to find more information if they're interested. And have fun along the way. I had fun. You guys in the audience probably didn't have much fun. <laughs> But maybe I only care about me. I don't know. <laughs> all right. That's all. Any questions? Yeah. I thought, first of all, you should be commended for all your thought process going into the teaching and to think about, oh, what if somebody finishes too fast, how to keep them busy and things like that. So yeah. I think that was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, back in the dark ages, I took Fortran and BASIC. <coughs> How does Python fit into that? And I mean, I was able to program in BASIC, but I obviously can't anymore. But is it simple like that? Or? Yeah, I would, I would compare Python to BASIC in terms of simplicity. It's a very simple programming language to learn. And, and uh, there's concepts that are definitely different, uh, but it's easy to pick up on. So BASIC was fairly, the basic principles of BASIC <laughs> are pretty easy to pick up on. Uh, Python is sort of like that. Fortran, a little more complicated. And so I would say Python is easier to learn than Fortran, and it's also got a lot of the expandability features that I was uh, talking about. So the students could really continue to learn with this. It tries to do a different thing than Fortran, but um, I would say it fits a nice middle ground where it can do sort of both things. I might be a little bit biased, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Were they all boys, Brent? They were not. Um, it was still, a, I mean, sort of expected. It's 
I didn't break any boundaries in you know, the, the workforce here, but I think I had three or four girls I'm having trouble remembering now. Uh, so a little under a third, just a little better than average. So um, there were girls involved and a couple of the most interested were, were girls. So um, I think they enjoyed it too. Thanks. Yeah. How'd you get the uh, word out about it? Um, yeah, so since Joe Sebesky worked at the Career Center, uh, people come there from like the towns nearby, all sorts of uh, kids from 8th to 10th grade and up to senior, but I only did the 8th to 10th range. Uh, so he had access to a lot of students that I just couldn't have contacted otherwise, so that's how I got the word out in the main way. Uh, it filled up in two days, so I didn't really have trouble. Well, I want to echo what Elliot said about the thoughtfulness in the teaching process. I think that was really well done. I've often been, I haven't learned, well I did learn basic, yeah, back in the day, but I haven't learned computer programming in it since then, but I'm often frustrated when I go to a workshop that's just trying to teach me how to use a software program. And so one of my questions to you would be, obviously this was successful and it worked, but if you had unlimited resources and people is this the best approach to take, or are there other things you'd have done, given you know time, resources, etc.? I think that this is better than any other way that I've that I've seen or done mm -hmm. to to learn programming because it was interactive, uh, because Python is not just a uh, um, a software package that does one thing, but <coughs> something you can expand to so many things. Um, I think the students really enjoyed this first of all, and then they also learned along the way. Part of that, I think, was my teaching process, which, again, I think that's part of what you mean, that definitely I would, I would do that part the same way. Um, show them an example, have them do a project themselves to try and uh, increase that active learning. And then I think that the visual aspect of it, too, seeing the LED move, seeing the servo and the robot move, that that was important as well. Um, and that worked for this application. It wouldn't work for all applications. Uh, the active learning, at least, is sort of, I guess, widely acknowledged as being one of the best ways to learn. So I would definitely uh, keep that. Anything else I did? Is there anything you would add if you had all the resources you wanted? Um, more time, for sure. Um, two days, uh, we were rushing at the end. You know, they all got it done and it was moving and they were happy, but I would have preferred more time, um, which I could have done. I could have said it was three days, but I was worried about student retention for three days. Uh, for two days, they all came both days, and I was pretty happy with that. Um, another day, I don't know what would have happened. So. More time would be the main thing. I'd have to think about the other things, but I could certainly use more powerful computers that do the same thing and make a better robot that didn't uh, jerk around like this one did. I could do some things, but I'd have the same general concept, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. How, how, how much younger do you think you could go, Brandon? I'm thinking, you know, fourth and fifth. I understand yeah. that you are that your population of the Career Center was the range that you used, mm -hmm. but do you think it's applicable in like fourth and fifth grade? For I think I think it is. I think maybe I'm not capable of it. You know, besides being the most patient person I've ever known times ten, <laughs> still not patient enough for fourth and fifth graders. Um, I think it's possible though. I, I I definitely think it's possible. Because it's so engaging, right? Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Um, it requires. It's been a while since I was in fourth and fifth grade. <laughs> Not actually that long, really, if you think about it. <laughs> but it, it requires a little bit of a, you know, sort of logical thinking. So I think there's definitely some students in fourth and fifth grade who are capable of it. And some of these eighth grade students that I had were, you know, the fastest at it. So it's definitely possible. Um, would it be as easy? Definitely not two days. And getting all the way from knowing nothing to a full moving robot would take time and patience that I'm not sure the students would have. I don't know. It'd be fun to try. And what's next? Um, I don't know. Uh, for me, I just for me in this project, I want to finish the website and make it public. I think once this is like fully done, um, it, it's close. I'm making it sound like I just made this yesterday or something. Um, but uh, once it's done, I think it could be a really valuable learning resource for this many different communities you can go to, you can post whatever you want and people can learn from it. I was thinking of how successful sure. your workshop was. Yeah. And that event and that experience is, you know, wouldn't it be great if those kinds of things could yeah. be available? To um, 
in terms of, well, first of all, so um, the guy that I worked with is now doing a similar thing at the Career Center. So I sort of inspired something there, but I think he was already mostly playing out and doing it. I just changed what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. So a little bit there. Um, it'd be fun to do something else in the future. I'm not currently planning on doing the same workshop. There have been a lot of requests for it, but I sort of don't know where I'm going to be yet. It'd be fun to do this again, though. Um, and I think I could make it you know, a little bit better. What did it cost? I mean. Yeah. So uh, each of these, like this full thing here is under $60. I think it's actually under $50. So in terms of cheapness for, you know, robot, small computer that you can continue to use for things, this is within the range that I think most kids with, you know, their parents' permission are going to be able to look at and say, if this is something that I want to learn, I don't have to be super invested financially in this, that they, they could buy this. So it's $50 each, um, so not too much. And you had volunteers who were helping you as far as the workshop was concerned. Yeah. And the facility was something that worked yeah. out without extra cost. Yeah, which was more than I could have asked for. That's $50 with the 2D printer, or 3D printer? Not worth a 3D printer, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I wish. If I, yeah. so you made the parts and then you had to put them together? Yeah, and it was a time intensive enough process that I put them together before the workshop, but it's definitely possible, um, you know, these are just like run-of-the-mill kind of screws and stuff holding it together. Uh, definitely possible. A lot of libraries and such have uh, 3D printers that are publicly available, especially like bigger towns like Fort Wayne does. So people with access to that or, you know, a university could, could print this off. I mean, it depends on the ink, right? So not anybody can come in and say, I want to make a robot. And yeah, there are different, um, they're called filaments. It's the whatever plastic you stick into the 3D printer. Um, so, I mean, it depends on those, but a library will have access to any of those, yeah. Can you give some information about, for example, the grant process that you know you were able to find to support this? Because it was not easy to find the finance, right? No, you are <laughs> you're right. So maybe this might help you yes. others for the future. Yeah. Um, so I got a thousand dollar grant for this, um, which originally I was hoping would be enough for you know more than one workshop. Didn't turn out that way. I won't bore you with the details. Um, me finishing the grant was a little bit sketchy. It was sort of last minute. Uh, Dr. Ariglu and <laughs> Dr. Eunice were uh, very helpful in just getting that shoved in last minute, but I ended up getting the grant, so big, uh, big thanks to both of you. But um, it was the uh, IPFW's uh, summer research grant for students. So any of you that are interested in summer research, you can get $1,000. Uh, you put it together a good proposal, and I mean, you, you, you've got money, so I don't know. What else do you need besides money? Uh, so, um, it's really just a, uh, a matter of putting together a good proposal because, you know, just word of mouth, I've heard that a lot of the proposals to that are not particularly good. So if you put together something that you care about, then uh, you can find this money for future research. Thank you. Anybody else? Is it lunchtime? <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you all very much.